Hello, my name is AJ Pickett and this is a very quick video on the topic quite important to those who have an interest in travel between the planes of existence throughout the Dungeons & Dragons multiverse. In the player's handbook for whichever edition you happen to enjoy, you will note that the spell called Plane Shift has a special component required in the form of a little tuning fork and that it is really quite expensive and it must be attuned to a particular plane of existence. In 5th edition D&D, Plane Shift is a 7th level conjuration spell that can be cast in a single action and takes effect immediately. Up to 8 people who want to go to a certain plane of existence with the mage who cast the spell need to be linking hands or at least touching the uh, mage in a circle or whatever, or at least, you know, gathered around and touching the mage when the spell is cast. Also, the mage can grab and attempt to banish an unwilling creature who gets to make a charisma saving throw to avoid being teleported to a specific dimension. It's not so much a magical portal spell, it is simply transdimensional teleportation by way of attunement, which is why the tuning fork is so vitally important, and today I can tell you exactly why. Back in April 1987, Jeff Grubb was putting together the Manual of the Planes, which covered over 40 different dimensional locations and loads of information about the adventures one can get into. However, there was a lot of other information that they couldn't quite cram into the book, and so Jeff wrote a series of articles for Dragon Magazine, and in issue number 120 he wrote about the tuning forks, so I'm here to relate that information to you. Back then, Plane Shift was a 5th level clerical spell, there have been a few changes to the spell over the years, obviously. For instance, it recently added one additional person to the transport effect. Earlier versions had almost pinpoint accuracy, but in 3rd edition the spell could deposit you 500 miles from where you wanted to go. The tuning fork has had some alterations, mainly due to the setting in which the spell was cast. For instance, in Karatur, the Shugenja spellcasters use a special coin with a hole in it, engraved with symbols of the plane and worn around the neck, typically on a leather cord. But by far the most common material component is the metal tuning forks. As mentioned, the ethereal and astral don't use metal. Uh, the ethereal plane uses glass and the astral plane uses quartz. Now there's a good chance that the astral plane fork will break when you sound it and transport to the astral plane, and there's a 100% chance that the ethereal plane fork will break when you transport yourself to the ethereal plane. So in most cases, these are one-way trips. You have to acquire another tuning fork in order to get back there. Uh, but the other known attunements do use metal. There are some gaps, for instance it's unknown what the tuning fork requirement is to get to the positive and negative planes, and while a steel fork attuned to the tone of C is the component to get to the prime material plane, I don't know if it takes a minor or a major chord to get to the Feywild or Shadowfell, or even if those are considered different layers of the prime material plane. <laughs> Do you even consider that they were layers of the prime material plane? <laughs> they kind of are when you think about it. For most other planes, the first layer uses a single pitch. The second layer then uses a minor or major chord of that pitch, which requires more than one tuning fork to be struck at the same time. So there's extra components required for getting to the deeper layers of existence. While all of the main para and quasi-elemental planes tuning forks are set to the pitch of A, they all require tuning forks made of different types of metal to get to the other planes, for, but for some of them they use the same metal and some use an alloy. Well, only the para-elemental planes of ooze and ice use alloys. Anyway, if the metal is the same, the size of the tuning fork is very important. Being tuned for sharp or flat pitch is important for quasi-elemental planes aligned closer to the positive or negative plane. If this seems confusing, let me remind you that they don't call it arcana because it's easy stuff to learn, and your average wizard in D&D is a lot smarter than me. For the upper planes, most of the tuning forks are made of gold, and for the lower planes, most of the tuning forks are made of iron. It's important to note that where the tuning fork is native to, where it was created, is also really important. A fork made at a certain destination is going to return a spellcaster back to that same location. I think... <laughs> also, of course, where the caster is originally from also makes a difference, though the origin of any passengers of the spell don't seem important unless it's a single target unwillingly sent somewhere by the spellcaster. On the world of Toril, 
In ancient times, when this spell was only available if granted by divine powers, the spell was known as a transcendent wind, as divine spells were thought to be the actual breath of the gods, and the weave was their song of creation, which explains a lot of the belief that is still uh, reflected in the faith of the gods Ogma, Melil, Denier, and Gond. You could say the focus of the followers of Denier on mathematics and the writing of symbols is that view through the eyes of the linguists and scribes taking down the notes and the notation of the song, while Ogma and Melil's focus on the song is that of bards and other spellcasters who are focused on the flow of the weave, while Gond is a bit different to the others, more focused on the melody of materials to form new structures, inventions and such, so Gond is a composer. In truly ancient times, the creator races were the first to develop ways to travel between the planes, and they all used magic, and some, particularly the amphiboid Batraki, also created impressive physical structures to do so. These monumental portals, known as gates, with their great, uh, when their great empire fell into decline, were left behind, and a great number of those artifacts, some of which have survived for tens of thousands of, year, of years, have remained functional. So those stones and their location, and particularly at certain times of years, when the tides and winds and weather and the other uh, planets in the world sphere of... Uh, the the toral sphere realm space as they call it are all in attunement those stones will resonate and those portals can open of their own accord in some cases and others they need activation so final thoughts and notes on the subject it pays to pay some attention to the spell components and use them in your game in some cases they are there to put some additional limitations on the casting of otherwise pretty powerful spells and traveling between planes of existence can be very powerful and disruptive as the DM, you can make that easier or harder to handle for the player characters, simply by limiting or increasing the ease with which spellcaster player characters can get their hands on the correct components. Diamond dust and perfectly sized tuning forks of pure gold are not exactly commonplace, and you can't exactly buy an attuned tuning fork from another plane of existence off a shop shelf. In that regard, if your players happen to kill a devil who drops an iron trident, to wizards who wish to create tuning forks that will get them to the planes of the Nine Hells, this trident becomes extremely valuable. So keep that in mind. Materials native to other planes of existence are always valuable to those who practice spellcasting and crafting wondrous magical items. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'll be back with more for you very soon.